You know what I've been, uh, you know what's dawned on me here just over the past couple of days is that I rarely have anyone tell me what God has done for you this week. What, where you have seen God this week in your life. You know, uh, so if this time, ladies or gentlemen, can you tell me that something that God spoke to you, something that God revealed to you, someplace where you saw God's hand moving in your life in this past week? Anyone? Aaron. I've been seeing God's hand in the recovery of my mother. Uh, when she started getting around a little bit better, and I realized this week, you know, how, how far she's come. Uh, and it's all by the grace of God. Praise 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 Praise God. God shows up when we need him. Someone else. Barb. I know most everyone knows what I have. It's been a rough last couple of months, but the last couple of weeks, I've been feeling almost as normal as I could possibly feel. And I've been get, able to get a lot more done and just feel that period. And, that's, and then with um, the last week, I came up about the school. Do you notice when you said as normal as you can be that I f refrain from comment? Did you notice that? <laughs> yeah, right. So the school she's talking about is the Ferrer School of Theology that uh, we, we learned a little bit more about last Sunday. It's put on by Full Gospel Assemblies, and, um, and they had a special promotion last weekend that anyone that was going to take six credits or more would get a 40% discount. Uh, I am... I am so convinced that there is no better investment we as a church could make that the church is going to add 10% to anyone. If you want to take a class with the School of Theology, whether you take one class or you go all the way through and get a bachelor's degree in theology or a ministerial certificate, you take a class every semester that you go, our church will cover 10% of the cost for you to go. There's no better investment that we can put in than to invest in our people learning God's word. You will grow excellently exponentially. You will grow. You will be amazed at how God will speak to you. You will read things in the Bible that you've heard or read a thousand times before, but somehow God will make them real and fresh and alive and write them on the page of your heart because you have committed yourself to being a student of his word. So that, uh, that, um, that uh, offer applied to Barb and it applies to every one of you. Uh, the registration uh, has to be done. Well, I actually have applications and financial aid applications with me. Uh, if you're interested, whether it's one course or many, just come see me afterwards. And uh, the money is first due sometime right before August or in the end of August. If you're ever interested in that, uh, just let me know. So, um, Papa John, you had your hand up, I believe. He, got, he liked it so much, he got up and done it again. Huh? Is, is that where I kind of interjected in the conversation? You said somebody looked out and you were there, and the next moment just the lawnmower was, or something like that? I come up the top of the hill, my neighbor was cutting grass, and he wondered why the cord that I was using came to the end of my property, and I wasn't there. So I Good. 
Cherry. Amen. And that is my goal. Uh, so I'll just continue on. You know, we've got, you know, atheists, the, the people that work on my team, the atheists, there's a Jew, there's, you know, people that are coming from different walks of life. And so um, it just makes me more excited that I just want to be able to be a, a witness, and be a living witness, but not only that, speak about how Jesus has been good in my life. So continue to pray for me and I'll be there. Amen. By the way, her nickname is Scout. Scout, like Boy Scout, Girl Scout. Her nickname is Scout. And the reason I gave her that nickname is because she like looks at all of these things that are happening around me. And she sends me all these emails. There's this going on. There's that going on. Do you know about this? That? And it's like she's just out there scouting around for things. So her nickname is Scout. And just feel free to use it. Uh, anyone else? Anyone else? I'll tell you about what God did for me this week in just a couple minutes. Let's get started, shall we? You know, the past uh, month, we've been reviewing our purposes of why God made us as a church. And, and we're now up to our third purpose that we started talking about about three weeks ago, which is touching our world. And here's our very familiar baseball diamond that kind of reminds us of, of why we are here as a church, New Life Fellowship. And it also reminds us of what we're supposed to be, what's supposed to be happening in our lives as individual children of God. We're, we're, we're born again and then we're supposed to strive to grow in God as individuals. That's kind of like getting the first base. It's learning how to practice discipline as we read our Bibles or, or attend services. And, and then we have growing with others because we're supposed to be in fellowship with others. The Bible talks about iron sharpening iron where we kind of get together and we rub against each other in a good way and, and we encourage each other and we build each other up in faith and we challenge each other and, and check on each other. That's growing with others. And now we're talking about touching the world around us. And, and, uh, and so we, it may not seem like they were real connected over the past month, but we've actually been on the topic for three weeks. And the first week, I just want to kind of do a quick review. Uh, the first thing that we talked about was that, um, that if we're going to talk about touching the world around us, it really comes down to uh, being willing to serve God because serving God by serving others is at the very heart of touching the world. If I'm not willing to serve God by reaching out to someone else, well, I'm probably not going to touch the world very well. First Peter 4.10 says this, it says, each one has received a special gift, so employ it in serving uh, serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So we're not only told to serve, but we're also saying, we're also told in that verse to do it well. Make sure when you serve, do it well. Do it to the best of your ability. It's, it's the grace of God extended to us through them and, or, and to them through us and from God. And, and, you know, most of us, truthfully, most of us have to learn how to serve. We have to learn how to serve. We start to follow God and come to church for, for typically for what we get out of it at first. We needed God and somebody said, hey, come to church. And, and God comes and he touches us in a very special way. And, and so when we first start coming to church, it's pretty Pretty much what can I get out of it? That really shouldn't be very surprising to us because uh, it, it shouldn't be surprising, but it shouldn't remain that way either. Uh, you know, a baby is born into a family. That baby is completely helpless and needing constant care and love. And, and as good parents, we'll sacrifice. We will struggle to give them everything that they need. Uh, but as that child grows up and as good parents, we expect and we prepare for them to take on the responsibilities of adulthood. They're, they may start out as infants, but we expect them to grow up. Well, that same thing is true for our spiritual lives. As spiritual babies, we typically begin coming to God for what we need, but as we remain in fellowship and as we mature in our faith, we should begin to exercise that spiritual maturity by serving God through serving others. Ephesians 4.15 says this, it says that we are to grow up. 
We're supposed to grow up in all aspects of him who is the head, that's Christ. And then so that means that we all need to find our place in touching this world around us. Now, two weeks ago, we listened to Tim and Diana, and they were telling us of their time living in Mongolia. Wasn't that nice? God, God sent them to some foreign country, and uh, it, good for them. How, how wonderful that how wonderful that they uh, be willing to sacrifice life in America to do such a worthy thing. Just just don't ask me. Just don't ask me to do that. And uh, in fact, I think if some of us were really honest, when we looked at the pictures of their time there, we may have kind of said secretly to ourselves, "Better them than me." You know, here's the question that I have to ask us. If we were given the same opportunity, would we follow God to what appeared to be such a desolate or perhaps backward place to serve him? Would we be willing to do that? Or, as you have heard me say before, would we rather stay fat, dumb, and happy in the lifeboat of heaven? So, you know the thing that struck me most about what Tim and Diana had to say last week was their attitude that they expressed. This is what they said. They said, I get to be a part of what God is doing here. I get to be a part of what God is doing. I get to bring my portion of gratitude, my, my sacrifice of love, and I get to join it with all of the people who have lived for God before me, who will live for God now, and who will live for God after me. I get to bring my offering of gratitude and worship and sacrifice, and I get to join it with all of the heavenly hosts, with the angels and the seraphim and all of the, Christ, all the saints before. I get to join in them in giving glory and greatness and expressing all of that to God. I get to be a part of that by touching the world around me. That's actually what I got out of it. Is that what you got out of it? You know, when we began this series on touching the world, we've talked about it a number of times, but when we began this series, I never really considered it to be about missions. But now I realize it really can't be anything but missions. We have to talk about missions if we're going to talk about touching the world. Well, well, what is a mission trip then? Let's give us a couple definitions. It's very simple. A missions trip is where you go to a particular location for a fixed period of time to serve others through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what a missions trip is. You go to a particular location, a fixed period of time, to serve others for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't matter if you go across the ocean or if you go across the street. That's the big difference that I think we miss. It doesn't matter where it is that you go. It's still the same thing. It's going to a particular location for a fixed period of time to serve others through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, in the first church that I attended and served at, I went on two foreign missions trips. Both were to an orphanage down in Mexico. And, uh, and, and these missions trips that you take, they create wonderful experiences. They can change your perspective on life. And, and if nothing else, uh, most people that go on a short-term mission trip will return home with a, with a fresh sense of gratitude towards God and a very special awareness of God's presence. And here's why. Because God is so good, God is so good to us that even while we are sacrificing perhaps our time or our money or our skill to serve others on these trips, at the very same time that we're sacrificing, God blesses us with the very things he wants you and I to receive from him. God always is rewarding his children for obedience. So, so that happened to me as well. Each time I, I got to go I, and I, I came back with some very special memories of God moving in them down there, the people down there, and in me. And then when we left that church and we went to pastor in Wisconsin, they primarily did home missions. Instead of, instead of going into other countries, they found ways to touch the world of Christ literally in their backyards. And as an example, there was a group of guys that they called themselves the woodchucks. Now, we were in Wisconsin, and so heating uh, cost in Wisconsin, if you were paying for gas or electric, it was 
astronomical at times. And so lots and lots of people burned firewood. And these guys in the church, the woodchucks, they would go to the homes where the, where the folks were struggling or they would needy or, or there was one particular family that uh, their son was in a wheelchair and things had gone badly for them. And we would all get together on a Saturday morning and we would go and we would cut firewood and split firewood and make firewood and make sure that all of these families had enough wood to get them through the winter to help save on the cost of heating. You know what that was? That was a missions trip. We went to a particular location for a fixed period of time to serve them through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what that was. And, and, uh, and so we would go there. That was short-term missions, like our Project 500, you know, where we go out one Sunday and we drop off the bags and then we go out the next Sunday and pick them up. That's a short-term missions trip. And it's a lot like those woodchucks. It's just a couple hours once a year. But what is it? It's a good way for us to fit into the community. It's a good way for for us to make a small difference and so we keep on doing it and now that church up in Wisconsin currently what they're doing is they are making meals at the holidays for the people uh, the church is right outside of a little town called Stanley Wisconsin it has maybe 3,000 people last year for the Christmas meal that they served on Christmas Day they made 450 meals that went out from that little church that tells you the need that's up there, right? So that's a place that they found to meet a need. Also, they go down and they work at a youth camp in, in Arkansas. And uh, well, what about us though? What about us? We, we've done some meals. Uh, we've, we've done some holiday meals. Some of you may have been here, I don't know. But we've done some Thanksgiving meals and things like that. There was a while that I think once a month we were offering free meals to anyone that came from the community. You were here, right? So, uh, you know, we've, we've done some stuff like that. We did the free-for-all. Remember the free-for-all? Boy, what a fiasco that was. We'll never do that one again. But uh, <laughs> right idea, right heart, didn't turn out well at all. Anyway... But I think right now we do have a real opportunity, and that is in the Philippi missions trip. It's a, it's a home missions opportunity that has been brought to us by Keith and Lynn Hayes. And uh, I'm going to have Keith talk about it in just a minute. But at Philippi, it's, a, it's going on the last week of June, right? Last week of June, so it's just a couple weeks off. And it is a great opportunity. It's close to home. Uh, Philippi, West Virginia is how many hours away? about two and a half hours away, right? It's two and a half hours away. It's totally flexible in how long you go. You can go for a day, you can go for a week. Uh, it, it, uh, it's extremely low cost. Um, it, it takes basically a tank of gas to get there. And if you don't have that, you can ride with someone else going down and, uh, and, and you're gonna need a little bit of money. You're gonna want money for that gas if you're driving, but you're also gonna want some money for the ice cream store that they keep telling me about. Right, you have to have money for an ice cream because God wants to bless you with ice cream. That's what that means, and uh, and there's something for everyone to do there. Something for everyone to do, whether young or old. And, and you know, uh, whether it's whether it's missions abroad in Mongolia or whether it's a home mission uh, like in Philippi or or chopping firewood in, in the neighbor's backyard up in Wisconsin, that is the one thing that all missions have in common. The one thing that they all have in common, the common denominator across all of them is that there's always something that needs done somewhere. Something needs done somewhere. There, there's more than enough need Jesus said it this way. He says, the harvest is ripe, but the, but the workers are few. That's right. Remember how I asked you what God did in your heart last week? This is what God did in mine. Something happened to me last Saturday at that, at that rally that honestly surprised and shocked me. And here's what it is. Uh, after years now, of hearing about missions trips without blinking an eye, I'll be honest, missions trips, I, I, I haven't blinked an eye. I felt God told me to go to the country of Malawi in Africa. And I was honestly surprised. And, and I, have, I have had no desire, I've had no inkling of any kind to go on a missions trip anywhere. I really haven't. And, uh, and so while I was sitting in one of these meetings on Saturday and the speaker was speaking about something completely unrelated to, to uh, missions of any kind, I, I just 
God impressed me that I was supposed to go. And you know what I, the very first thing I did is I questioned God. I said, Africa? Really? Africa? And you'll see why in a minute. But you know what? In my heart, I couldn't deny that this was God's voice. And uh, I couldn't deny it. In fact, I immediately checked the schedule on my phone to see if I could go to this year's trip. I just, I, I was amazed. You know what Mark 16, 15 says? It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So somewhere around September next year, after the rainy season of Africa goes through, that's what they're telling me, after the rainy season comes through, I'm going to go join a couple ministers from Full Gospel Assemblies, and we're going to go to Africa, and we are going to strengthen and teach in the Full Gospel Assemblies churches that have been recently formed there. And that's pretty cool all by itself. But what really blows me away, what really blows me away, the thing that I think is the most amazing about this is how God changed my heart, how he truly just changed my heart. You know, for years when I've taught or on, on learning how to serve God, because I said you have to learn how to serve God, I would always say a phrase like this. I would always say something to the effect of, look, just because you start to serve God doesn't mean he's going to send you to Africa or something. I guess I was wrong. I guess I was wrong. And that might be the most important point of all. 1 Corinthians 9.16 says this. It says, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. You know, that's a lot of times, if you're wondering, gee, is this God telling me to do this or to do that? A lot of times, that's how you'll know if it's the Spirit of God talking to you or not. He will put a burden in your heart that you can't deny. And it will burn inside of you, and you can't ignore it. You can't deny it, and you can't, sat, you can't satisfy it in any other way than obedience to it. It just won't go away, and you'll know. And that's what happened when he called me to ministry school. That's what happened uh, when he sent me to serve at our first church, and that's what happened when he sent me to serve at our second church. And as much as I didn't want to hear it, that's what happened when he pulled me out of Wisconsin to plant this church. And woe of me. Woe it is to me if I do not obey. How do you know if God's telling you something? Is it burning inside of you? Have you tried to ignore it and it doesn't go away? Guess what? Good chance that's God. Good chance that's God. So one moment, a mission trip like that, a, a missions trip anywhere, was nowhere to be found on the radar of my life. No matter how far out I looked into my future, there was no mission trip anywhere on that radar. And the next moment, God speaks to me, and I am all in. The only thing that changed was me. The only thing that changed was my willingness to be obedient. See? What did we say? There's always something to do somewhere. Lots of harvest to be harvested. Not enough workers. The only thing that has changed is my willingness to go. That leads us to our last message on touching the world around us. It was given last week by Minister Larice last Sunday. I like Larice and Miguel. They are, they are fun to be with. If we, if we, well, they're going to try and maybe get back here every six months. We're trying to work on that. And if we do, we got to have a picnic or something to just hang with these guys. They're a hoot. We just have a lot of fun when they're around. Anyway, uh, they love God, and I love them for that. And uh, in that message, Larice talked about the 10 lepers that Jesus healed. Here's the scriptures, Luke 17, 12 through 17. I'll read them for you. As he entered a village, 10 leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. 
Verse 15, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? So the healing itself was a miracle, right? Do you know that there is still no cure for leprosy? They still don't know how to deal with leprosy. We, the same disease that ravaged men back then is alive and well today. They still can't fix it. But God can, right? So, uh, so I mean, it was a miracle that they were healed. And, uh, and, and, but... Here, these ten lepers, they were literally now, because of the leprosy, they were the outcast of society. They were forced to be isolated from their families. They were not allowed to be touched. Would you take a look at verse 12? Do you see it says they stood at a distance and called out to Jesus? There's a reason for that. Because back in that day, if you were a leper, uh, and if there was a person that didn't have leprosy, and they were getting too close to you, before they got too close, you were supposed to start yelling, I'm clean, I'm unclean, stay away. And so that's why they stood at a distance from Jesus, because they knew they were unclean. It was a warning. And so these 10 lepers came to Jesus asking for help, and they were instantly healed by him. And, and Jesus sends them off to the Levitical priest to be officially judged as clean and free of leprosy in accordance with Jewish law. Why did he do that? Because that would confirm to everyone in that day that this miracle was the real deal. So 10 lepers are given a new lease on life. They're able to once again live among their families. They're once again able to hold their children. Once more, they're able to sit at a table with other people. They can walk the streets without yelling, unclean, unclean. 10 lepers asked God for help. God gave them the help that they wanted. And then they continued to live their lives without so much as a thank you. Only one, only one of them came back to say thank you. And Jesus took notice of it. Verse 17, he says, well, where's the other nine? Where, where's, where's the other nine? Where are all those others who have received as you have? You know the problem with a scripture like this? The problem with this scripture is what it makes us do. The problem with a scripture verse like this is it forces us to ask ourselves the questions that reveal the true condition of our hearts to us. You see, God already knows the condition of our heart. We often don't recognize it in ourselves. And so when he says, where's the other nine? We read about one that comes back to say thanks, and we read about the nine that didn't. We are forced to ask, well, God's done all these good things for me. Have I gone back to say thank you? Have I gone back to him and said, I'll live for you? Have we done that? Have I, am, am I a person that have taken and taken from God without any expression of gratitude or loyalty, loyalty to him in return? Do, my, do the actions of my life represent a thank you of all that God has done for me? Or is my life like the one is my life like the one who returns or the one who just takes without recognizing the importance and acknowledging God? Do a quick review of your life. I know I say that a lot here, but it's important. Do a quick review of your life. Have you been adequately expressing your gratitude to God? That's a real question. We're going to come back to this in just a minute. Keith, why don't you come up here and tell us a little bit about Philippi? Carly, could you give me this mic, please? Anyways, um, when the pastor asked me to talk about missions and stuff, uh, of course I was more willing because of the fact of what God does in your life while you're on them trips. How I got started with missions, I mean, I didn't have this angelic visitation or I didn't have, hear God speak to me. I was sitting in a service and there was uh, a United Methodist Church in Port View and the mission team leader was up there talking about getting a team together to get down to Baldwin, Louisiana that was hit by a hurricane. She no sooner got the words out of her mouth, I turned and looked at my wife and I said, I'm going. 
That was how I got started. There was no hesitation. There was no praying about it. I just, I'm going. Of course, there was fundraising to do and so forth and so forth. And driving through Kentucky, <clears throat> I was the co-pilot because we told there was 15 of us went down, so we took the church van. And I was the co-pilot, and she was driving at the time, and we were going through Kentucky, and she looked at me and says, you know, once the mission bug bites you, there's no turning back. And boy, she was right, and that was in 1991. I got, we got down there after the first day of work down there. I shouldn't say work because it doesn't seem like work when you're, down, when you're doing what you're doing. I felt a peace within me that was like no other peace I ever felt before. The best way to describe it is when you wake up in the morning and you see a pond perfectly still. That's the peace I had inside of me. I knew that was from God. I couldn't wait to get on the phone and tell everybody. I start calling everybody I knew and told them about this peace that was within me and how, you know, and so forth and everything. But anyways, uh, then the following year we went down to Philippi and every year that we go down there, you go down there to be a blessing to these people, but you end up being blessed by those people. One, one time, uh, the one uh, trip, that we were down there and a project we were doing, the, the family, you knew they didn't, they didn't have a single extra penny to spend on anything. They prepared a lunch for us that was like, it was a feast. And you knew it took everything they had to prepare that. That is so humbling and such a blessing. You know, and it just, it, every year that I go down there, I, matter of fact, <laughs> It's funny because like the day, the day we leave, I just sit there and tell my wife 365 more days till Philippi. And then the countdown starts because I anticipate this like, like a kid anticipates Christmas. And I get so excited about going down there to help these people and to see the smiles upon their faces and, the, you know, and so forth. We did a trip one time, but we also our, our task was to tear off of a, uh, uh, a part of an addition that was put on the house. That was it. That was all we were supposed to do. We tore that off, but the rest of the house had that insole brick siding and stuff on it, and this was all exposed wood. And we just, the whole team were sitting there at lunchtime, we're just looking at each other. We said, we gotta come back. It ended up, we went back that September, sided the house, and that the following month, we went back and put a roof on it. But one thing that was really stood out was that really, really, really was amazing is that the woman that we were doing that for, when we first started siding the house, she was watching us and she started crying. And we're like, why is she crying? And she says, I always wanted a house with that color siding on with maroon shutters. We had no idea the color that she had in mind it so happened that a job that I did, I had a couple extra square of siding left over, and that's what we based it on, is that's the color we were gonna put on the house because then the rest, we just bought the rest of it, you know, through fundraising and stuff. So we had no idea. That was all God. And then, and then putting the roof on, <clears throat> I used to do roofing for Ryan Homes, and we always had leftover shingles, and I accumulated all these shingles over the years, and, uh, so we decided to put the roof on, and they were just gray shingles. They went perfectly with the siding and, and so forth. But I didn't have a way to transport them because 20 square shingles is too much for a pickup, plus all, my, uh, plus all my equipment and everything to take down with me. There's a gentleman there that, has a, uh, that does a towing service and has a flatbed. He says, I'll take it down. He took everything down. That's how God works on these things, does with these things, you know, and it's just so awesome to see how God puts this all together, you know, and it takes all of us to do, to do this. It just, it just doesn't take those out in the field and getting their hands dirty. It takes the helping of the fundraising and so forth and so forth. It takes the prayers and everything, you know. I mean, it, it takes all of us to do it, you know, and it's been such a blessing for me over the years. And then just not with, like with me being self-employed, I don't get vacation time. I don't get paid holidays. So if I'm not on the job, I don't get paid. But God 
put a plan within me on how to take care of that. So instead of me, so what I do is throughout the year, I just put X amount of dollars away, X amount of dollars away, X amount of dollars away, so I don't, I have that money for whenever I'm back, that I don't miss anything. I'd have never thought of that on my own because I, me and money is like, you know, I have it, I spend it. So, you know, just saw how God worked in my life each and every time. And then, you know, like I said, it's humbling for what they do for you and stuff down there. And, and you don't, it doesn't feel like work. There's times we'll work from daylight till dark on projects and it just, it just doesn't feel like, you know, like you're working, you know. And the thing that I like to do is I think I shared this with you before, but one of the reasons why I do it is because it is. It's the marble. We, had a, we were doing a project on a house, had a little girl. At the time, she was only seven years old. And at the end of the project, she come walking over to me and she goes, I want to thank you for working on my house and gave me that marble. That melted in my heart. This is why I do this. Just that. And that, that was, I forget how many years ago, and this past year I got to see her. She's a teenager now. I got to... I got to see her again, and it was, it's a good thing. Because we, we do build relationships down there, too. Not, not every family, but some families we do. One family, we've gone to their uh, daughter's wedding, graduation, and so forth and so forth. They've come up here and stayed with us for a little bit and everything and so forth. So it, it's not just, you know, you go down and work for, this, work for this, uh, this family. You build a relationship with some of them, you know. And not only that, but every year, like, you even come across them every once in a while, you know, because they have lives, too, and they have to work and so forth. And that they'll, they'll remember you. Hey, you worked on my house. Hey, you did this in my house, you know, and stuff. And they, want, and they thank you. We've had, had uh, family members from uh, previous years come over and help us on, on th this year's, like, say, this year's project and so forth and everything. So it, it's, it's an ongoing thing, and, it, and I'm telling you, if you go, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. It, you know, I can't, I can't, the, 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 like it says, the peace that I have, and the, I, the, I'm just look so forward and doing it and everything, and you have to do it with the right attitude. I can remember one time I had an opportunity to go to Alaska on a mission trip, and I always wanted to go to Alaska. I was like, yeah, I'm going to Alaska, but my attitude was I'm going to Alaska because I've never seen Alaska and I want to go to Alaska. Two weeks before we were supposed to leave, I was working and I heard God say to me, you're not to go to Alaska. I went, ouch. I went, okay, and I didn't. All because of my attitude wasn't I was going, I was going to Alaska for me, not to serve him. And it was a bitter pill to swallow at that time. You know, because I was so excited about going and wanting to go and stuff like that. But anyways, <clears throat> this year's project that we're going to be doing is uh, down in Philippi is a, uh, it's an addition, a small addition. What happened was is uh, this uh, person's house burnt down. And what that person's living in right now is a larger shed that was purchased from like Home Depot or Lowe's. And right now, my understanding, the person has no running water, but has some kind of electricity that's like semi-rigged up. That you know, I'm not a complete understanding of what he's got as for what that person's got for electricity. But uh, uh, matter of fact, Lynn and I are going down there this afternoon to check it out to see what's going on as far as it goes, what we'll be needing, and so forth, and everything. But I encourage you to come come along. I mean, you don't have to go for a week. You know, it's it's usually the last. Last week of June is always our, our assigned week. So it doesn't change from year to year to year. And <clears throat> you come for a day or two. We usually stay at a ch in, a, in a church, you know, that has separate rooms. You need to bring a cot or an air mattress, you know, something to sleep on, and some uh, towels and washcloth because there is shower facilities that down there. And of course, the, uh, the uh, church has a full kitchen because there's always people needed for kitchen crew. Don't worry about your skill level. We will teach you. Not a problem. You know, I mean, but it, it's, you know, like I said, it's, it's a really, really blessed time to, when you see the smiles on them people and the gratitude that they have and so forth and everything. And 
some of the, the conditions that they live in and everything is unreal. You know, <laughs> the one project we did, the house, the bottom of the house was all invested in termites. And actually, the master bedroom floor was nine layers of linoleum on dirt. That was, that was their floor. We jacked up the house, cut the, cut the bottom two feet, two, two and a half feet off the whole house, <clears throat> put it back together and set it back down. Then put the floor in there, put a, a floor in there for them to, to, so they would have some, something substantial and not have to have that, uh, live in that the way it is. Some of them places that they live in, there was a family that was living, uh, there was 13 of them living in a Scotty trailer. We went down there and put a two room addition on there. The little girl that was getting her own room, we had just put the floor down, no walls, just the floor. She slept in her bedroom that night. You know, I mean, it's, they were, it's just they, so much appreciation of what they appreciate so much of what you're doing. And they want to do so much for you, but they're, you know, they're limited. But just to thank, yet thank you is all I need. You know, God told us to go out and, you know, Jesus came to this world and said, I came here to serve, not to be served. Well, I want to be like Jesus. I want to serve, not be served. Even though, the, the, you know, it comes back to you, it'll come back to you. It definitely will. But anyways, I encourage you to come on down. Thanks. I'm going this way. You know, as we look to grow into our next level of spiritual maturity, and touching the world around us, we have to do it in both big and little ways to make it happen. At that same conference last weekend, near the end of it, I heard one minister say that, that we all need to be participating in missions in some way. Did you know that? Here's how. Everyone has a role to participate in missions, uh, uh, either home or abroad. Everyone is either going, sending, or praying. Everyone is either going to the mission field or we are sending others to the mission field or we're praying for those in the mission field. And maybe you can't afford to go to Africa with me next year, but you can send me just like we sent Carly to Ocean City for that leadership training. We can send other people in our church. If, if God is calling you to go somewhere and serve in missions, we will send you there. We will help you be obedient to what God is challenging you to do in your life, whether that's in Africa or in McKeesport. And if we can't go ourselves, at the very least we can do is there's nothing that should be able to get you there no matter what it takes for us to do it. Listen, look around at this sanctuary. We completely remodeled this sanctuary in like two weeks in a few evenings and maybe a couple Saturdays. Is that something like what it was compared to what it was, right? We tore up floors, we ripped down things, we built things, we painted things, yada, yada, yada. I, I, I'll bet you, I'll bet you if you're willing, if you're willing, you can find a way to go to West Virginia for a day or two. Maybe you can go for a day or two right at the end of the month. I'm going to go for two days. I'm going to try and go for three if I can. And, uh, and, and, and we can make a huge difference in such a short period of time. Keith and I were discussing the project last Wednesday night. And, and I want you to think about this. When you leave here today, as you pull into your nice driveway and press your button to open your garage door, or as you walk from your kitchen to your bathroom to your bedroom, I want you to think about this today. Right now, there's this person living down there in a shed. A shed, right? You know, like an eight by eight shed, maybe? That's where he's living in. I came across this, uh, I came across this uh, on my first missions trip to Mexico. I came across this house, okay? This is what it was. It was four pallets, four, four by four wooden pallets. There was one on the side, or there was one on each side, there was one across the back, and there was a pallet laying across the top, and that was the roof. That was a home for two people. They lived there every day. You looked in, you saw one dented pot that they would cook in. 
They had a couple raggedy old blankets that they would use to sleep on and cover themselves. That was a home for two people. And at that time, we didn't have any resources to really be able to do anything for them, but I gave them all that we could give them. I gave them bags of rice and bags of beans, and I gave them a Bible, and that's as much as we could do. Folks, we can go down to West Virginia for a couple days and make a huge difference in the life of this person. We really can. And every time that we show up and we work at that house, and every time after that, after we're gone and that person walks into that house, Again and again, they're going to be reminded that God did not forget them. We can make a real difference. And what about us? Well, what do you get out of it? Here's what you get out of it. The feeling of satisfaction of helping someone else. The feeling, the feeling of hurting, believe it or not, because you wish you could do more. Um... And, you know, the feeling of knowing that you're giving to someone who can't give back, the, the, the feeling of knowing if things were a little bit different, it could be you in that circumstance and not them. The feeling of knowing that God's using you. All, all of those feelings and more are the rewards that you receive for your sacrifice and your labor you bring. Do you know that the word give, G-I-V-E, Give is found in the Bible 876 times. Not given, not gave, not any other tense, just the word give 876 times. It means to present voluntarily and without expecting compensation. And as we grow into our next area of spiritual maturity as a church, we will be challenged to not just take from God, but to give to God. And, and we need to give our time by entering the mission field, close to home or abroad. Africa, Mexico, China, East McKeesport, North Versailles, Monroeville, we need to enter in to the mission field. We need to. We need to give our time, we need to give our resources, which is more than just money. It's, it's time, it's materials, it's monies, of course, it's skills, it's expertise, it's creative ideas, it's time and money-saving techniques. Because here's what the Bible says, that God has gifted each of us with resources that are beyond our wallets that we can give to serving Him and serving others. It says it this way in 1 Corinthians 12, 4, 7. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. A variety of ministries in the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Look at verse 7. This applies to you. This is what it says. Each one, point to that person next to you, elbow that person next to you. Each one of us, each one of us is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You know what that means? You will never be empty-handed. There's always something that God has given you that is usable for Him. And so we need to give our time by entering the mission field. We need to give of our resources, and we need to give our hearts. And this is actually, whether you realize it or not, the hardest one to do, because it requires me to become willing. Right? It requires me to be the one out of the ten who comes back and serves as a way of saying thank you to God for all you have done and are doing for me. When we give our hearts, it's a heart that dedicates itself to praying for the mission stream team when we can't go ourselves. It prays for things like protection and good weather and favor with local leaders. It's the one who prays that God through his Holy Spirit will give who is ever there the right words that will be said at the right time to reach people's hearts that will break the chains that bind them and bring them the freedom in Jesus Christ who loves them. It's the heart that is praying for others this is how Scripture says it in 2 Thessalonians 1.11. It says, God chose you. God chose who? You and I? God chose you. God chose you, and we keep praying that God will make you worthy of being His people. We pray for God's power to help you do all the good things that you hope to do and that your faith makes you want to do. So praying, it's easy to say, I'll pray. It's another thing to pray, right? That's where we're going as we try to accomplish our third purpose of touching the world around us. In, in far places, in close places, in big ways, in little ways, we want to touch the world. That's our goal. If you are a, 
If you feel God's telling you to go to West Virginia for a couple days or whatever, you can talk to Keith and Lynn at the end of the service, get any information that you need. We will get you there. You'll be blessed, and so will they. Could I have a couple guys to help me with communion? David, would you help me? And Tim, would you help me distribute the communion gifts, please?